You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. And I want to welcome to uh, the Final Say Radio Show. We have Mark Hemingway, who's with the Weekly Standard. And uh, Mark, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Here. Well, it's very interesting. I, I was just commenting on. It, it really bothers me when you and I and all the other members in the media or journalists or people who follow what's going on, and even just the American public, have to continually wait for the president to show up to his announced press conferences. And I, I don't know, I wish if they were going to pop out at 11.15 that they wouldn't say, it, you know, be there at 10.50. <laughs> right. So let, let's start off with that because I think it's a consistent trend and I think he's done this. I don't remember any other president in the, uh, you know, I, I've been following this stuff since uh, Reagan. But right. I don't remember any of these presidents being as disrespectful with the timeliness of things of that nature as this president has. You know, that's a good question. I mean, it has been a real annoyance uh, in recent, you know, years to, 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 with Obama, you know, appearing much later than he was supposed to at the press conferences. You know, I don't really know. I, I haven't gone back to look at, you know, George Bush or Bill Clinton or, you know, and beyond to see whether or not they did similar things. But I think part of the problem here is is that these sorts of small slights uh, seem to be exaggerated annoyances because Obama in particular doesn't otherwise signal that he cares, you know. Uh, I think that's the big problem. Absolutely, and and that's the optics that I'm looking at right now, and I, I'm glad that you could join us to discuss this, because when I see a disinterested leader, or, I mean, or somebody who's trying to actually be a leader, and I think he may be failing, but I, I watch his facial expressions, I watch him looking down at the ground, I, I watch the, just, you could hear it in his voice when he tries to speak to the American people or the people of the world on any particular issue, that he's almost not there. And I, I don't know how you feel about that, but it's really starting to annoy me. And I'll take it a step further. If you're Vladimir Putin and you listen to what the president had to say today, are you, are you afraid, are you worried that he's actually going to take any significant actions where that's going to stop you from continuing on a path that you're on? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, you, you, you've really hit on the crux of it. Uh, um, to be perfectly honest, in the past couple of months, uh, Obama, I mean, looks and appears to be a bystander, you know, as leader of the free world, and it's 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 kind of you know terrifying to to witness um, this. And and more than that, if you, I mean, you actually just look at his actions, he, he he's acting like a guy who's semi-retired. Um, <laughs> you know, when obviously when <laughs> maybe they, he is. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, well, obviously when the airline era in the Ukraine was shot down last week, you know, he was on an out-of-state, you know, burger run uh, in Delaware. You know, the optics weren't, you know, great for that. But, you know, at some point you could have, you know, he could have canceled the fundraiser he was on his way to. He could have done any number of things to, you know, more overtly signal that, you know, I was caught unaware maybe, but, you know, I have now dialed it back. I'm going to get things under control and I'm going to, you know, see what's going on in this situation. You don't get any of that. It's just, you know, just life just goes on. You know, it, it's like the inertia presidency. You know, he has a schedule and he's sticking to it, you know, no matter how much of the world is in flames at the moment he's trying to, uh, uh, you know, get on with his presidency. Yeah, I think you're, you're right on that. And, you know, let's go back a little ways, even back to Jimmy Carter. Uh, you know, we, I'm more conservative, and of course, uh, you know, a lot of things about Carter I, I disagree with, but I didn't think he was a terrible president. I think he, he had some misfortune, and of course, some of his policy ideas were a little off the mark, but he wasn't terrible, but he certainly, at least to me, looked presidential, and then he, he ended right. up you know, stuck with that Iran issue, which is, you know, I, I don't know many presidents who would have recovered from that to begin with. But then you look like a guy like Reagan. We understand Reagan. I mean, what he did for this nation is, um, you know, we owe him such a debt of gratitude for helping us face uh, one of the greatest challenges this nation ever had. But then he even stepped into like a uh, uh, Bill uh, Clinton, and Clinton started off rough, but I think he realized pretty quickly that he had to work. You know, he had to work with the American people. He had to work with the other side of the aisle, or nothing was going to be accomplished. And what we see today is a president who, here's my ideology, 
either take it or leave it. And I'm going on another fundraiser or I'm, I'm going out of town or I'm playing golf or I'm doing this and it's all Congress's fault and it's the American people for not believe, not understanding me. I, like, that's the way I look at it. Right. No, I, I think that's actually sort of a useful frame. I, I, you know, certainly I see that in Democratic presidents like Clinton and Carter. I, I get exactly what you're saying. You know, obviously they had ideas that a, a lot of the country maybe didn't agree with or didn't appreciate how they were going about things, but they certainly acted as if they were president of the whole country and not just, you know, particular constituencies and, yes. you know, not, weren't consumed by the fact that there were people that may be trying to uh, impede their particular policy progress. Uh, I would... I mean, maybe Clinton got a little consumed with the impeachment and uh, his his uh, infidelity at the end of his presidency, but that was almost a non-ideological thing in certain ways. But, you know, if you go back and you look at, like, for instance, you know, Carter's terrible, terrible malaise speech, um, uh, that was Carter, whatever you want to say about him, it was, he was genuinely trying to, you know, communicate to the American people that he recognized that things were bad and that, we, he, you know, hoping that we could come together to, um, you know, collectively address the problems that we were dealing with, and there were many of them at, at the time that he was stuck with. Now, granted, his message was terrible, and it didn't resonate, and, and we now look back at the Malay speech and say, wow, it was terrible. But the underlying impulse behind it was a fundamentally good one. Um, with Obama, we don't see any of that, hey, let's come together stuff. And then when we do see um, anything that, that purports to be about, you know, um, our responsibilities as Americans are coming together, it's so transparently it's, it's so transparently something that he's trying to exploit. Like you see his co recent comments on economic patriotism. I mean, he's exploiting <laughs> patriotism just to get, you know, uh, American people to advance a particular economic agenda rather than, you know, trying to get us to come together and solve problems in the abstract and recognize our shared responsibility. Right. Yeah, I find that interesting. We've created a scenario where we, we already had very high taxation at, at all levels, uh, corporate and, and individual. And, of course, we do everything we can to raise those levels to where we're the highest in the world. We can't compete on that level. And then it's, we're supposed to be patriot by being non-competitive in the world market. I mean, it doesn't even make any sense how he goes on in that. And then if you look at the immigration issue, I'm not going to go down to the border for a photo op at the same time, he spent the entire day participating in photo ops for various causes and, and things right. that really weren't that important outside of padding uh, bank accounts for various campaigns or whatnot. Right. So, yeah. Well, but the, yeah, that's a classic example there of the immigration crisis, certainly, because you have a situation here where the polling data confirms that you know even Democrats probably don't want more immigration, and you know, but yet it doesn't matter. You know, you have these highly organized, profitable constituencies, uh, and the president himself ideologically isn't committed to doing what the American people want, so you know he just shrugs and tries to ignore the issue as best he can. Meanwhile, there's fifty thousand children being warehoused by the federal government at the border, you know, and there's a real humanitarian crisis there. Um, but, you know, it's not one that he's in his interest to solve. Uh, whether or not it's in the American people's interest to solve, he doesn't care. Yeah, that's just exactly right. Now, I just want to get back to the some of these uh, international uh, incidents and things that have happened over the, the last bunch of years. If you look at Iran, I think we, we have been so weak with Iran, and I think it's only... Uh, the, the messaging has been much worse with this president, so I'm, I'm putting blame on past presidents here. But I, I think what we've basically messaged to Iran is it's okay to support terrorism. It's okay to actually train and maybe even supply uh, fighters that face us in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. It's okay to send the weapons and funding and all this stuff because we're still going to negotiate with you and we're really not going to do anything to stop you from your nuclear program. Understanding that even regardless, if if we don't take away their program, they'll be close enough at any point and have the materials in hand to be able to process it into a bomb in a, in a certain amount of period anyway. So I think that's a, a horrible message. And quite frankly, I think Vladimir Putin is is watching how we're handling things such as Syria and what we did in Libya, uh, the lack of response to Benghazi, the uh, uh, looking at Iraq, just sitting back and watching that happen again, all these things. And Vladimir Putin really has to be thinking, okay, we may have shot down a plane. And, of course, you know, that's our, the, what we're assuming now. So it's still slightly up in the air. But that's what we believe. And what are we really going to do about them outside of sanctions? 
nothing. And, and I think at this point he feels if Iran can get away with it, if North Korea can get away with it, if China can get away with it, and all these other nations get away with it, I'm just going to play it out. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that, that uh, um, you know, these are, as you point out, pretty good examples of, of what's wrong with Obama. And I can't decide whether or not this is because the president has some sort of unflagging, you know, utopian view of human nature and what people, you know, really want, uh, or this is just some unflagging ability uh, of Obama to, you know, never, ever, ever question the force of his personality. You know, whatever mystical quality that got him elected twice is somehow going to win over everybody else in the rest of the world, regardless of whether or not they share the same values to, to begin with. Um, and, you know, or, or maybe he just can't even tell the difference between the two. Um, but, you know, again, we see this again and again where, you know, any time it looks like there might be actions that require the president to risk anything politically or require us to actually just do something that, that, that requires great effort, uh, the president prefers not to do that and in insisting instead that we'll just open up dialogue and the other people will come around to be it Vladimir Putin, be it Iran, be it the, you know, the, you know, the Olympic Committee bringing the Olympics to Chicago, uh, you know, uh, whatever trivial thing that the president somehow purely by force of personality can convince people to do what he wants. And then he's like continually surprised and disappointed when that persuasive power actually doesn't work out. Um, uh, I just, you know, I wonder what he's thinking about just in terms of his legacy. I mean, you know, surely it's one thing to believe these things, but it's another thing when you just see them don't, when they don't produce results again and again and again. And, you know, he's got to be thinking at this point in time what people think about his legacy, and he doesn't appear to even care about that. If he can't be motivated by that, I mean, uh, what's left for him to be motivated by? It's just astounding. Very well put. So let, let, let's look forward a little bit, because clearly, uh, I don't know if you can call it a lame duck presidency at this point. I mean, it's definitely lame what's going on, but I, I, I think you know we're definitely in dangerous waters, and I don't expect him to get all that much done as far as legislation at this point, unless, of course, it's by executive order. But we're going to have an election in 2016, and someone is going to look to replace him on the Democratic ticket. And, you know, of course, the front names that are being thrown out there, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Hillary Clinton, and uh, you know, possibly Joe Biden. What do any of these people do to try to separate them from what Obama has done? And is that even possible at this point? Well, that's a good question. Um, it. It is interesting, and it depends on the candidate highly. I mean, Hillary Clinton, as we've seen, the Clintons have absolutely no compunction about throwing their um, enemies under the bus, and I think we've seen enough signals both uh, before Obama's election when Hillary's running against them and even now after, now that Hillary's out of the, the White House, um, that you know they have no compunction about criticizing um, Obama. And as I think as the election heats up, the Clintons have enough of their own power base. They don't need to p depend on Obama to uh, get elected. So they're they're not going to feel any compunction about necessarily defending him or his record. In fact, when it comes to criticizing Hillary's, you know, State Department record, um, uh, which is going to be a huge thing in the next presidential election, it's in, it's entirely in their their interest to blame everything on Obama. Uh, and uh, frankly, I might even be sympathetic to Hillary of all things on that point. Um, so. That that will be the, the the position that Hillary's in. Um, it'll be different for somebody who's more of a favorite of the liberal base, like Elizabeth Warren. Um, um, but I don't know if it's necessarily to say Elizabeth Warren's advantage because Obama won by putting together a really unique electoral coalition where you know he he, he had a very large, an unbelievably large share of the minority vote and wealthy Americans, and he just sort of bypassed. The you know middle class and white voters in a way that I don't think that um, almost any other presidential candidate could afford. Um, I think Hillary Clinton is going to have to build a different, more traditional Democratic electoral coalition involving a lot of working class um, Americans that Obama just sort of completely ignored the concerns of. Um, whereas Elizabeth Warren is going to be captive to the same constituency as Obama. Uh, but I don't think she's going to be nearly as motivating to certain, you know, demographic groups, particularly minorities, to get out and vote for. So it'll be definitely interesting um, to see what happens there. 
Uh, one, one last question on this particular issue. Is there a chance, you know, we've seen so many elections where it's, they, they, they get so nasty and down in the mud, and you, you, don't, you see a lot of um, optimistic statements made, but not any real clear policy presented. Is this the one time where we may see some actual um, good, clear, concise economic plans or maybe immigration plans or, or foreign policy plans presented by some of the candidates in both parties? Uh, I see absolutely no evidence of that. <laughs> the problem <laughs> is, is that the modern media climate is just such that they are, you know, can spend 24 hours a day picking apart the flaws in every proposal, and every big policy proposal is going to involve, you know, trade-offs. So you know, they're going to, and, and the media being biased as it is, is going to, you know, pick apart any big um, conservative ideas, you know, by by um, playing up the trade-offs in ways that are really unfair. Uh, as for Democrats, I mean, let's just look at what the Democrats are talking about right now. I mean, all the Democrats pride themselves on wonkery, and, you know, they're doing all these things to, you know, whether it's like, you know, reams, reams of young policy journalists at the Washington Post and Vox.com and other outlets are constantly talking about all these smart new ideas. Well, if you look at what they're actually proposing, I mean, the ideas that they're proposing, like increasing the minimum wage, uh, you know, Thomas Piketty's basically wa watered down Marxism of you know about inequal income inequality debates, um, right. things like universal basic income. I mean, these are ideas that are 40, 50 years old that people have been kicking around forever, and no one endorsed because they were obviously stupid to begin with. Um, and so, trying to build momentum around you know ideas that are totally not fresh, uh, just because again they appeal to various constituencies um, that they think will. It'll be motivating to them uh, to get to the ballot boxes. You see a lot of the same things, you know, with the assault on religious liberty, and, uh, um, and you know, it's just motivating to single women to to be to tell them that you know they're not going to be able to get an abortion, even though it's or birth control, even though it's obviously not true. Um, so the policy debates anymore have just become really about getting people out to the ballot box. They're not about actually having uh, debate over ideas. And alas. Right. Well, it, look, it's a great strategy. I mean, you let illegal aliens become citizens and give them $15 an hour in free housing. I mean, it makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, uh, certainly there are certain constituencies in the Democratic Party that, that see this as a huge deal for them. Right. Well, it's, it, it's definitely interesting. Uh, you know, I look, when I watch some of the incidents as we've seen unfold over the last week or two, you, you certainly uh, hope for the best, and I guess at this point, I could just ask that the Congress steps up because I don't expect it from the White House all that much. Well, no. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens after this election because, um, you know, certainly Republicans are going to have, um, you know, almost certainly Republicans are going to have control of the Senate. And if they're going to, you know, it, it'll be really interesting when they start forcing Obama to veto legislation that broadly appeals to the American people, like, you know, certain immigration reforms or other things like that, um, assuming the GOP is willing to do that. But, they can certainly put forward enough legislation that will it will make the public aware of what could be done as opposed to what's being done. Um, but, you know, again, that requires us to believe that the, a GOP-controlled Congress is going to be acting out of conviction and principle and, and doing so vigorously, and I wouldn't place my bets on that just yet. I hope. Hey. So well, that, I, I'm with I'm with you. I I hope all the time that I get disappointed too often. So I, I definitely agree <laughs> with you. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, folks, Mark Hemingway, he's a senior writer with the Weekly Standard. Mark, what's the website there for the Weekly Standard? It is weeklystandard.com. E easy enough. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, folks, please check out Mark Hemingway. You can find him on the weeklystandard.com and check out and follow all of his articles. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye.